Hello and welcome to the Researcher Podcast, your regular look at the research that's making waves in the scientific community and the people behind it. My name is Joe Fenton and I will be your host today. So for today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Alkeos Sokos from University College London. Alkeos is the author of Modelling Outcomes of Soccer Matches. Today we'll be finding out a bit more about the paper and the person behind it. Alkeos, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So before we get into modelling outcomes of soccer matches, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your academic journey so far? Yeah, so uh, I'm Greek. I was uh, I was born in Copenhagen, but um, my family moved to Greece when I was three. I grew up there. Um, and then, yeah, when I was 18, I came to UCL and I've pretty much stayed there my entire uh, academic life so far, uh, with the brief exception of uh, a year abroad in, in UCLA, Los Angeles. For those that may not be familiar with your area of expertise, and for those that may not have read Modelling Outcomes of Soccer Matches, could you give us a brief overview? Yeah, so first of all, I should mention that um, it's joint work um, with Santoshna Yanan, um, my supervisor, Yanis Kuzmiris, um, Gianluca Bayo, Mihai Kukuringu, Gavin Whitaker, and Franz Kirali. So it's not it's not just mine. Yeah, it's a, it was a joint project that we were working on. Uh, so basically, um, a journal called Springer, um, well, Springer's journal called Machine Learning, they they put out this challenge to um, basically model the so- model outcomes of soccer matches. They they had compiled um, a quite large data set of around two hundred thousand matches. And the challenge was to just um, try to come up with a model that can predict the outcome of matches. And then the it was judged by um, predicting matches after the challenge had finished. So basically, within some period, there were some matches that we had to give forecasts for before they actually happened. Then the matches happened and the performance of the models was was assessed that way. So your piece uses two models in order to reach its conclusion. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about these models and the effects that they had on your piece. Yeah, so there were two main approaches. One of them is to directly model the outcome, so win, draw, loss. Um, And the other is to model the scores. Um, and then through modeling the scores, where you have basically a probability distribution for every poss- every outcome of scores, uh, from that you can then derive the probability of uh, of each team winning or or draw. Uh, so I worked more on I worked basically on the um, direct modeling of outcomes approach, and um, the modeling of scores approach was um, more Gianluca Bio's approach. And how successful do you think these models? actually were so it's it's quite hard to define success in i mean it's it's all relative right so you can first of all you can define a bunch of different metrics in terms of what how well a model performs um i mean maybe the most basic thing that people will kind of immediately understand is the accuracy in terms of how many what percentage of matches you actually correctly predict the outcome of um, I can't remember where we were exactly there, but uh, maybe we're around 52, 53%, if I remember correctly. Um, I could check that again. Um, but yeah, in general, it's quite difficult to model football matches. There's a lot of randomness involved. Um, and yeah, it's it's always going to be... I mean, maybe the biggest metric is if you can beat bookmakers' odds, because just because they... Uh, have a track record of, I mean, it's, it's their job basically to, to do that. And to some extent, they, they have a financial, I mean, not to some extent, they have obviously a financial stake in, in kind of getting it right to some extent. But also, it's not necessarily the case that bookmakers have the, the only incentive to correctly predict, to, to correctly give probabilities of outcomes because they also have to follow markets. Um, but in general, yeah, it will always be quite difficult to beat bookmakers' odds. And if you do, you make a profit in through betting. So obviously there's there's an incentive to do that. But that wasn't what we were looking at. We weren't in, we weren't interested in betting. We didn't try to test our models against uh, any betting strategies, see if it would work. Um, we were mostly just interested in, in the models and 
Uh, in terms of the other uh, participants in the challenge, because this was a challenge that was put out to, to anyone who was interested to participate, um, we came out third in the normal um, uh, in the normal challenge. But then after the challenge finished, we continued working on our models and we we improved some of them. And we didn't actually have time to submit the results of the the modeling scores approach. That approach turned out to be best. And once we did check how that performed, it did do better than all the rest. And also the modeling outcomes approach. Once we um, once we improved that a little bit as well, that was second best, also better than all the rest. So both of the approaches that we considered, even though they're quite different between them, they did do better than than all the rest that that were in the challenge. I don't know, of course, if, if others refined their models as well after the challenge, but but yeah, as far as we know, these these were the two best performing after the fact. So being quite a big football fan myself, I was highly interested in your discussion about the proxies and how injuries and how many matches are played in a week affect the outcomes and how this affects the data and the models. But I'm just wondering, if you were to have added any more proxies, would this have changed the results of your study at all? So the, this dataset was quite limited in that all we had access to was the actual outcomes of previous games. So... The general approach, I mean, a general approach in, in machine learning and, and to some extent in statistics and predictive modeling is, is something called feature engineering, uh, where the idea is that you, you have some data and then you want to use that data, transform it in various ways in order to, to, use, to, to come up with what are called features or variables that um, can be predictive of something. So, for example, the most, the most obvious thing that, that one might do in, in a scenario like this is based on all the outcomes of games, you can tally up the total number of goals that a team has scored so far in the season. Or you could um, tally up the, the number of points that the team has accumulated so far in the season. So we, we come up with various features like this. Um, ideally, I mean, there's no limit to, to what you could consider. If, if you had access to, to more data, you would you know, what you would ideally want to include everything in your model. But of course, there's always a kind of trade-off in, in predictive modeling where the more features you have, the more complex your model becomes, and you need much more data in order to be able to accurately estimate this uh, model. Otherwise, you, you run the risk of overfitting, where basically you're, you're no longer capturing a trend, you're just um, capturing noise in your data, and then you would actually have bad performance on predicting new games or, or new instances. Um, but in terms of in terms of football, yeah, it's it's really what your data can provide and and the capacity that your data has. Um, ideally, in the model, you would like to have, as you said, things like injuries or or you know many different things change before a game. There could be dynamics within the team. There could be um, you know maybe a coach is not is not um, is not having a good relationship with with players or there could be. Basically, there are infinite things that could be going on, and it's it's impossible to capture them all. But ideally, you would want to capture as much as possible. We did not have access to anything other than the actual um, match outcomes, and so all we could do is anything that can be derived from that. Um, we didn't actually spend that much time on feature engineering, so we could have spent more time coming up with with different features. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we used the basic things and then tried different models and, and different relationships in these models in order to see how far those features could go. Obviously, every author wants their piece to have some impact. So I'm just wondering, what do you believe could be the impacts of your piece in either the real world or the academic world? So I think <clears throat> football is something that obviously a lot of people are interested in. So there's there's always going to be, to some extent, some interest in, in trying to predict games. And there's, there's a fairly old literature on this. It's, it's something that I think maybe people won't be doing it um, as their kind of main job. I mean, there, there are obviously lots of, there, there are some sports betting companies that will be doing this as a main job. It's, it's their sole focus to, to just predict outcomes of games. And that's in order to make profit. But I think a lot of people may just be interested in this as, as a kind of hobby. Um, it's just, it's mainly something fun to do. I should also mention this wasn't actually, this isn't part of my PhD, my main PhD research. This is just, um, this was a side project that kind of came up and um, we worked on this as a group. And it was, it was mostly something fun. So 
Yeah, I think the the impact will be people who are interested just as a hobby to kind of play around with some data, and people who are interested in sports and football, um, mostly that. And then some people may be interested in kind of seeing whether there were any conclusions that could be used if they are interested in a, in a sports betting or something like that, but, but that wasn't our focus. So this particular paper was a side project, as we discussed earlier. So what is the main focus of your PhD? So my, my PhD, I'm in my fourth year of my PhD. Um, it's funded by, it's part funded by British Cycling. And the idea is to, to kind of use, use statistics and use statistical modeling to, to look at training data um, and see if, if we can come up with any useful models that, that maybe explain what types of training are, are beneficial. But that's the very applied um, part of it. Uh, more methodologically, I've, I've looked at various things over time. Um, I started with an interest in something called functional data analysis, which deals with data where data that come in curves. So anything that can be considered a function of something, some argument, it could be time, for example, and you observe um, that function evaluated at various argument values. So you, you observe the function, basically. And you want to do things like that um, like regression maybe or traditional things that you might do in statistics um, but I've moved on from that um, I've looked at things like um, the, the most the most recent project I was working on was um, determining the relative importance of, of different groups of predictors in the regression model um, and in particular types of regression models where you use a technique called regularization um, which is a technique mostly used to either to prevent overfitting or to impose some structure in the type of model that you're trying to fit. So Springer ran this as a competition. So was there any funding involved? And what have your experiences of funding been like so far? Yeah, so this, this is, um, th th there wasn't any funding for this. This was just a side project that um, was mostly just for fun. It wasn't tied to any particular project or any particular funding. Um, my PhD is, is uh, my supervisor secured the funding for my PhD before I actually started. So he offered it as a project. And um, yeah, I, I took it up. So following on from my last question, and this question is quite similar. I'm just wondering how you found the whole process of publishing. So I've actually only published this one paper. Um, and the process was quite straightforward precisely because there was a call for papers in response to this challenge. So I haven't actually gone through the process of writing a paper, trying to find a journal to get it published, and then that whole process. Um, this process was quite smooth. Um, there was a call for papers. We, we, we wrote up a paper with the team. Uh, we submitted it. And um, yeah, there was a... Um, there was a review process, got back some, some feedback, made some changes, published, it was published, yeah, quite quickly. So it was, it was pretty smooth. So you're a fourth year PhD, and I can kind of guess the answer already, but I'm just going to ask you, who has been your academic role model? In academia, that's, that's a tough question. So um, probably my, my current, my PhD supervisor at the moment, um, I've had kind of varied interests over time, but um, I think I've definitely learned the most um, in terms of gaining a broad understanding and deep understanding, as, as one might would expect. I've learned the most in my PhD, and, and I think, yeah, my, my PhD supervisor has sort of um, provided a lot of guidance, a lot of, um, he's helped me to, to sort of understand things in, in a particular way. Um, so yeah, I think I think he would probably be the most most influential person in my academic career so far. Okay, now as a fourth year PhD student, how do you usually spend your week? It's um, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's just kind of doing research and um, doing yeah, doing research and um, I spend. I split, kind of split my time between UCL and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, my supervisor has a, is a joint fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and he, he's also um, a lecturer at the uh, University of Warwick. So he splits his time between Warwick and, uh, and the Alan Turing Institute. And um, I meet with him there. So I go there a couple times a week. I also go to UCL 
and uh, mostly yeah, I just either go I go to one of those two places and um, spend my time on my computer either writing code or, or kind of writing up reports um, or reading papers that's that's the kind of routine so you've mentioned the Alan Turing Institute and for those that may not be familiar with this specific institute could you provide us with a little bit of context or background on what they do yeah so so it's a newly set up it's it's only been a few years now it's a newly set up research institute it's a it's a, it's a government research institute and the, the goal is to promote research in data science um, it's quite broad and it has affiliations with various universities and um, yeah there's it's it's a research institute and they do all kinds of things. So you could, um, they, they have kind of, uh, there's lots of statistics, there's lots of machine learning, there's lots of uh, applied math, uh, there's not lots of uh, natural language processing going on. And uh, the goal is to, yeah, basically touch on, on many different parts of data science and I think um, try to lead the way in terms of promoting research in all of these areas, understanding the impact that they have on society, maximizing the, the sort of benefit that these research areas could have for society. Um, but it's all quite new, so I think it's still sort of um, trying to find its way in terms of where it will have the most impact. It's, I think it's quite difficult to sort of set up a whole research institute from scratch, so it's, um, we'll, see, we'll see where it goes. But it's, uh, it's looking quite good. So your PhD is coming to a close. So do you have any career goals or aims that you want to accomplish after you've completed it at all? So I haven't actually thought about it that much. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do after. Um, I may potentially look for a job in industry. Um, so I don't really have a clear target um, in terms of what exactly I, I'm, I'm going to be doing, if I'm going to continue in academia at all. Um, so yet at the moment, though, I think I'm, I'm more focused on sort of getting getting there to the end and wrapping things up. And um, I'm still not quite um, done with I mean, with the work of my PhD. I'm, I'm still exploring new ideas. I'm, I'm starting a new sort of focus now. No, not an entirely new focus, but but kind of a new project. Um, that I ho that I hope I'll have enough time to to see through until the end, and then and then write up, and then maybe take a short break and and think about things a little bit and see what what comes next. Okay, so obviously productivity is essential in all aspects of life. So I'm going to ask you if you've got any tips that you've used to increase your own research productivity. Productivity is always a tough one. <laughs> um, I think, well, setting clear targets is a good starting point, even if personally I can't always stick to that. Um, yeah, having having sort of a, a clear goal, having a, a path that you that you sort of want to want to work on. Um, probably not jumping from idea to idea quite quickly because it can be quite easy when you're. You know, when you're reading papers and you're you're interested in research, you want to sort of come up with something interesting. It can be tempting to sort of um, come up with ideas quite quite quickly and quite often, and potentially jump too quickly from one to the other, and potentially leave leave things um, a bit hanging. So it's it's quite difficult to actually see things through because you know you have an idea, you might sort of see where it, have some ideas about where it could go. And then you get a new idea, which may be exciting, and you want to work on that. And um, it can be difficult to sort of focus and, and see each idea through to the end and actually get something, get something out of it rather than sort of jump around a lot. OK, and so for my final question, I'm going to ask you for your one piece of advice to anyone who may now be starting their own PhD. Right. Um, I think the most... Well, one of the most important things is uh, to have a good relationship with your supervisor. To It's obviously quite difficult because you won't necessarily know your supervisor that well before you actually start a PhD. Um, but because that is the person that you're going to spend the most time with, um, it's important that you, that you get along, that you um, have roughly similar um, outlooks and styles of working. Because if not, it can get quite difficult. Um, 
I feel like I've been quite lucky in that um, I've, I have a very good relationship with my supervisor and he's been very supportive and uh, and yeah, we, we work well together, I think, but I've heard lots of horror stories where it can just, I mean, if, because if you don't have a good relationship with your supervisor, it, you'll, you'll be miserable because that's the only person that you sort of, I mean, you, you may have a second supervisor, you may have other people that you're working in, maybe you're working in a research group. Um, but it can be quite difficult. And the other thing that I would say is that it is important to sort of reach out to people, talk to people, um, form connections, because a PhD can be quite lonely, um, because you, you'll, you'll often find yourself in a position where you feel like you're the only person who sort of understands the problems that you're facing. You're the only person who is working on this particular small area that you've chosen to focus on. And it can feel quite lonely if if you feel like you know you're you're sort of on your own and and you don't you don't really have people to talk to. So yeah, my advice would be um, reach out to people, um, find a good environment that you enjoy working in, and uh, don't get too sort of um, cut off. Okay, and so that's all we've got time for today on the Researcher Podcast. We've been joined by Alkeos Tsokos from University College London, and we talked about modelling outcomes of soccer matches. Alkeos, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, it was a a pleasure. And thank you for listening, everyone. Until next time. You've been listening to The Researcher Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. You can also follow us online at www.researcher-app.com. Or, alternatively, you can drop me an email at joseph.fenton at researcherapp.com. And before we leave you today, here's a quick review from one of our users. I personally really enjoy using the Researcher app. I just get this sense of a scientific community coming together because I get research that is tailored to my interests right underneath my fingertips and I you know I don't have to look anywhere and in that sense it kind of reminds me of using a social media app. Researcher is free to use on iOS, Android or on your web browser and if you enjoyed this podcast don't forget to leave us a review.